we've been looking at the book of Acts, which is really the acts of the Holy Spirit working through people that are faithful to Jesus Christ. And we see that in a profound way today as we take this huge turn towards persecution of the church, as we see in chapter 7 of the book of Acts with Stephen's sermon message and then subsequent death as the first martyr for the Christ. When we pray for an awakening in society and a great revival for Jesus Christ, we better first put on our seat belts because we may be in for a very great and wild ride. And I mean that very seriously. And perhaps with uh, what's taking place in our society today, we need to recognize that as believers, that we need to be serious about that point. As we pray for revival for God, uh, we recognize that he will use all sorts of situations, either blessings or challenges, to awaken a spiritually dead or lethargic people. A cursory view of, of the church and church revivals helps support that view. Uh, the second great awakening that happened in 1820-1830s uh, was a response to a moral fabric uh, of society being tattered. And Charles Finley's uh, fiery messages of repentance stirred up a populace to seek Christ and do good works. And as a result of that, it birthed the temperance, the anti-slavery, women's rights movements, as well as the, the beginning of Salvation Army and the YMCA. The Businessmen's Prayer Revival of 1857-1858 came on the cusp of a stock market crash, railroad bankruptcies, businesses going bankrupt, factories closing, high unemployment. And it wasn't led by any great or big name celebrities. It was rather a lay-led movement as they were chosen instruments of God used to awaken a people to faith in Jesus Christ. Even during the Civil War, there was a great revival. 1861 through 1865, a bloody conflict in which, interestingly, one out of 50 Americans died as a result of that war. 300,000, it said, soldiers came to Christ from both sides of that conflict. And then we come to the Welsh movement, which really isn't just a Welsh movement, but a movement that circumvented the globe in 1904. It began as a prayer meeting of Pastor Evan Roberts that grew to that worldwide movement. It was said that in Wales, drunkenness was cut in half. And as a result, many taverns closed their doors. Crime was so low that the courts were said to have been rather quiet and police departments had layoffs because of it. Even coal mines had work stoppages, not because there was worker management conflicts, but because there were so many foul-mouthed uh, miners that had accepted Christ, quit swearing that the horses that were pulling the coal carts could not understand their commands. The story in Edwin Orr said that transportation ground to a halt. The prayer that they had was, Lord, bend us. Lord, bend us to your will, your direction. And it turned into a motto for the movement that went like this, bend the church and save the world. Church people willing to be used as a voice for Jesus Christ during difficult times speaks to their commitment of their Lord and Savior in their lives. This paraphrase of Esther, of who knows but that you have been put here for such a time as this, is saying that I trust God is in control of this moment and in this place. And I am here to help show someone that is drowning in doubt and desperation, despair, where hope is found. God utilizes his church to work in every situation to bring people to himself. Step number one, and are you willing to take that 
is to put on your seatbelt and see where the ride takes you. In Acts chapter 6, verse 15, it said, All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw his face was like the face of an angel. Stephen was under investigation for blasphemy. His answers could cost him his life. And yet there was a certainty that God had placed him there in such a time as that. And that he had that an assurance. He spoke calmly but yet passionately, giving not a personal defense, but it was really a plea that his interrogators would, would recognize their historical failings, their current blindness, and open their eyes and see that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. His sermon was filled with imagery of, of Christ's sacrifice as shown through his own words and actions. Even to the point where it says, he trusts his soul into the Lord's hands and asks for forgiveness of those who murdered him, just as Christ did. His life and death point to his faith in Christ. Living and dying in complete trust because he trusted the Lord in all things, through all things. And he became the first martyr for Christ. His sermon comprised of two major themes. The first one is that God is not confined to any place or any people. He had worked throughout the world and not just to the spiritual elite of Jerusalem. God spoke to Abraham while he was in Mesopotamia and to Moses on Mount Sinai in southern Arabia. And God rescued Joseph from slavery while he was in Egypt. And to further irk his, his Jewish interrogators, Stephen added that Jacob and all of his 12 sons were buried in a tomb that Abraham had purchased in Shechem, which, by the way, lay in the region of those despised Samaritans. God works where he will and through who he will. So don't box him in or think that you have sole possession of God. Stephen's second major point is that far from being the religious, zealous Jews they claimed to be, the Jewish leaders had blood on their hands. Their fathers killed the prophets, and they had fought against Moses throughout those 40 years in the wilderness. And now they killed the long-anticipated Messiah. Historically, they worshipped Moloch, Baal, and gods of their own making. They loved their institutions more than they loved God. They had built a temple which God had not asked them to do. And they came to worship it more than to the one for whom it was built. They had never followed the Spirit's movements. And they were now refusing to look at the gospel message of Jesus Christ that gives life. I was told of a story of a pastor that went to a cocktail party. And he drank soda while he was engaging in discussions regarding his love for Jesus Christ with the other guests. And they came eventually to church and accepted Christ into their lives. However, upon hearing that he had attended a, attended a function in which alcohol was served, the church leadership decreed the pastor was negligent in his duties and terminated his position. Such was the denunciation that Stephen leveled against the Sanhedrin when he said, You stiff-necked people, with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you're just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. They were pretending to be religious when they were more like the offspring of their fathers who so often turned against the Lord. They ignored the spirits moving in their midst. They would not allow him to lead them and for them to be his witness to the world. Their obstinacy to God culminated 
in their betrayal and murder of the righteous one. I overlooked telling you until now about the first great awakening that happened in 1730 through the 1740s. It it began in part as the church uh, was merely play-acting about their faith. Non-believers came to the church and asked that their children might be baptized. And the church did so. They called it the halfway covenant because there was no faith involved but they had done so with the hope that it might kindle a spiritual yearning in those children for which the church itself lacked. Jonathan Edwards' plea uh, in sermons was a rational appeal to faith. And the theme of his message was sinners in the hand of an angry God. One observer of that movement said, in a short space of time, a great multitude of souls turned from a formal, cold, and careless profession of Christianity to the lively exercise of every Christian grace and the powerful practice of our holy religion. And it was said that 80% of the colonial Americans came to listen to another speaker of that movement, George Whitfield's dramatic preaching during that time. Rather than going into a spiritual uh, self-assessment that was based upon what Stephen was saying, the response of the enemies of Christ was predictable. They grabbed Stephen, took him outside, and stoned him to death. That Stephen willingly shared truth, knowing that his life was in danger, speaks volumes. He was thoroughly committed to sharing the gospel message, even to those who would do him harm. Christ died for the ungodly, yet very rarely will anyone die for the ungodly. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die, but God demonstrates his love for us, that while we were sinners, Christ died. Romans chapter 5. And that is exactly what Stephen did as well. He lived his life in full recognition that life eternal means that he's not going to die. He's merely forwarding his mail, so to speak, to a new address, which is in heaven. He's moving on. And for his faithfulness and trust that that was so, God allowed him to see into his new neighborhood with Jesus standing there right next to the Father. He wasn't seated at the right hand, but standing, standing before the throne to intercede on Stephen's behalf, standing to welcome Stephen home. And with that destination in sight, Stephen's last words uh, speak of his wishing well-wishing for those of his accusers and murderers, that they would one day be there with him as well, that they would see the light and accept Christ into their lives. So he prays for their forgiveness. And then it says, Stephen dies to this earth, but lives with the Lord. And as we see the curtain fall upon that stage, We get just a quick glance, perhaps out of the corner of our eye, of someone also standing there off to the side. That person is nodding in assent and approval of what was taking place. It seems a little bit kind of like our modern Star Wars movie endings in which we see a glimpse of that menacing next episode beginning to unfold knowing there's going to be a sequel coming along. It's the master evildoer. Paul, who ushers in a time of unspeakable persecution upon Christ's church. And it portends ominous news for a small group of believers that are facing off a massive empire. But we stop. And we're called to wait 
And I recognize that God is even in control of this. As we later see in, in Acts chapter 9, where God is speaking to Ananias, he says, this man, Paul, is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles, their kings, and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. It pretends problems upon God's people for sure. But it also suggests that God is in control. And he is going to make this man the greatest evangelist of all kingdom, of Christendom. And it was through his and the church's sacrifice and sufferings for the Christian faith that within one generation, that Christian faith exploded throughout the Middle East and into, they say, even into England, down into Africa, and over as far as to India. God's name is praised throughout Christ's com Christian's commitments to go speaking in the hope of Jesus Christ, regardless of life's circumstances. So number one, step one is to put on your seatbelt. Two, pray and proclaim Christ. And three, hang on. Hang on and witness God's wild ride of yet another great awakening. Go and do the same. God bless you.